today we're going to be talking about putting it all together, programs that inspire. Um, we have some amazing panelists uh, with us today who are gonna tell us about some of the programs that they've been working on. This is the third in our webinar series. We will drop um, the link to the previous webinar recordings in the chat. Um, our final webinar is going to be coming up on August 10th. Um, and that's gonna be looking at moving from contemplation to action, kind of bringing everything that we learned and talked about in the previous webinars together um, so we can figure out what steps we wanna take as a group to collectively move forward and make things more actionable. Um, so just a couple other housekeeping pieces. We have down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're probably all very used to this nowadays, but there is a Q&A box if you want to submit questions as we're going along. You can also engage in the chat. Um, in the chat feature, I already see people are piping up and telling us where they're from and what their names are, which is fantastic. I love to see an active chat box. Um, so if you have questions, you can put them in there. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and go to our next slide here, and I'm going to ask Robin to um, introduce herself. So Robin, I'm going to hand it off to you to go ahead and do a little introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Clark. I'm excited to be here. I am the assistant director or principal at the Utah School for the Blind, and I cover curriculum and instruction particularly over the expanded core curriculum, which is that disability specific curriculum for students with vision impairments. I get to have fun at our school and I also get to do statewide services supporting our students with expanded core curriculum instruction. Thanks, Robin. Um, I'm gonna toss it over a little out of order from what's on the screen right now, but I'm gonna toss it over to Eric so that Eric can introduce himself. Eric, go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Yarberry. I am the Director of Education and Training at World Services for the Blind. Thank all, thanks all of you for joining. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here and get to be on this panel with everyone else. Uh, what I do at World Services for the Blind is oversee the implementation of our life skills, career training, and transition age youth programs. Um, our career training programs take place here on campus and online. So I oversee both of those, but thank you for having me and uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks, Eric. We're so glad you could join us. Um, Natalie is also here too, zooming in from Australia. I'm not going to put her on the spot because it's just six o'clock in the morning in Australia. So Natalie is still waking up, but Andrea, um, who is assisting me with, with this webinar right now is going to take over the screen. So I'll stop my share and Andrea can then um, bring up Natalie's virtual introduction. Hi everybody, my name is Natalie Kane and I'm a pediatric occupational therapist and senior practitioner for children and young people with Vision Australia. And for almost 22 years now, I've been working with children and young people with blindness and low vision and their families in metropolitan, regional, remote, and very remote areas of Australia. I love developing and delivering individual and group-based programs, particularly in around career education and employability preparations. So much so, I am researching the topic as a doctoral candidate with the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. Before I start, I'd like to Okay, and that was that was just a little teaser for what's to come from, from Natalie um, shortly. I'm going to have Leslie take it from here, brought you back up there on the screen. We have our slides showing again. So Leslie, I'm gonna hand it over to you to kind of guide us and give us some foundation for the conversation today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. I'm so happy to be here. My name is Leslie Thatcher. I'm the Director of College Success at Perkins, and I also run the Compass Program at Perkins, which is our direct service program for college aspiring students grade 9 through 12. I, um, have, come, I have created this uh, webinar series with Annie and to serve our huge broad community of blindness educators and of higher educators and disability resource offices to continue the conversation and exploration about the state of college readiness for our students learning um, with vision impairment, but to also look at what we can do 
and what is already being done out there in the world um, to improve outcomes for our students. And that's a little bit of why we're here today is we want some inspiration. So what I'd like to do is take a minute to just reflect on the past two webinars that we've run, remind our, ourselves, this is a little teaching technique, a little spiral review, um, to remind us of what we've done. Our first webinar explored this, what the state of college is right now. College has evolved and changed a lot. We had speakers who talked about new college programming that helps college be available um, with the appropriate types of supports for a wide range of students now, both to get degrees and also to get um, the, simply the experience of being in college without the burden of some of the degree expectations. It's opened college up to students with autism, with intellectual development developmental delays and to really allow a broader range of students to explore college and for our students learning with vision impairments that could Im include some of our folks um, that we work with as well and we also have colleges that are much more adept at working and supporting first generation college attendees we have um, programs for english language learners programs to build up academic skills um, prior to enrolling in degree programs, certificate programs, and so on. So the first in our webinar series, if you haven't already watched it, is really inspiring in and of its own right. And it lets us know that our students are also tackling much more complex tasks with the learning management systems, um, simply the registration systems, and the, the legal landscape that changes significantly, at least in the United States, as students be become um, high school graduates and move into work and college. So our second session then began to go, okay, well then if that's the new world of higher education, what are the skills our kids need to enter that, that next step for those aspiring for competitive employment in college? And we worked um, to explore how to introduce technology skills, independence skills, and to bring in um, a broader awareness of and sensitivity to the unique needs of our English language learners and first generation learners um, in our second session. And today then that leads us to how do we bring this all together? How do we bring the, the research that informs what these new skills are that our students need into programming that develops those students to, to meet these new demands? And there are programs out there and for us, who are taking this time to watch this webinar series and learn and make sure you're thinking in ways that move your students forward. We wanted to show you some real thought leaders who are, um, and in my mind at least, on the leading edge. Um, so, and, and so that's why we brought these amazing educators um, to us today. I want to encourage you to consider taking, um, taking inspiration from these programs and also thinking about how you can make an impact moving forward. And that's gonna be what our fourth session's about. A final thing I wanted to at least highlight as you hear these folks talking today is how very intertwined these issues are of, for, all, for many of us on the call of um, educating students with a visual impairment but intertwining that with these other issues of first generation needs of English language learners needs of students who are learning in under-resourced schools and communities or with families who are struggling to support their aspirations for their post high school life. It's complex and it demands a real team approach. Um, so I want us to think of how can we bring teams together to support those students and also those students with a broader range of disabilities who may have a visual impairment, but may also bring a mobility impairment, um, a chronic health condition that may or may not be um, immediately impactful, but may impact as time, as time goes on as a student is attending college. And Annie brings great expertise in that regard. Um, but we often know our students arrive with, with um, not just a single challenge to their post high school planning, but multiple challenges. And so we're always looking at sort of the intersection of those needs. And we often find that a solution for one group is beneficial for the whole group, thus the universal design movement that's out there. Um, and so trying to think broadly as these folks, all of us introduce our, um, our programs. Uh, I'll leave you with a quotation 
um, that we cannot cross a sea by merely standing in the water. And that resonates with me as I think of the work I'm tackling through College Success and that these folks are tackling in the programs they're gonna discuss with you today. Um, they are not standing in the water. They're in some cases walking upstream, um, seeing if they can move the water to a different place. I could move on with that metaphor and I will stop with it now. But, um, but you can see there as we embrace a new way of thinking, um, that can really help us move in different directions. And I hope that we can take this as inspiration to take a more cross-disciplinary approach to look outside blindness education and really consider all of the other research going on in college counseling, career advising, um, first-gen um, programs that are really impacting success rates um, for students enrolling in college as a first generation student. So these all impact the outcomes for our students. Let's bring it together today and, and see what we can do to, um, to change these numbers and to uh, create better outcomes for all, our, all of our students. So um, I found my thing in running college success and we're gonna hand it over now to Robin Clark who has certainly found her thing. Um, at Utah School for the Blind. You ready, Robin? I am totally ready. All right, welcome everyone. Um, before we kind of go into my slides, I just wanna talk for a second. And I just wanna give permission that what we're talking about is overwhelming in some degree, and it can feel daunting. Um, but just because it's overwhelming doesn't mean it's not impossible. And that's the lens that we took. So as we talk about um, um, our program today, I could share a million things because I can talk for forever. Um, however, what I wanted to do was narrow down to the bullet points that can help create momentum because that's what we found the most success with. What were the small focused steps that we could take that would gain momentum to give us the outcomes that we need? Because although it is, again, overwhelming, it's also critical. It's necessary. If we're not going to give students the programs and the resources and the tools to live a thriving, successful life beyond post-secondary training or education, then what are we doing, right? That's why I, I came to this world of education to make a difference. And we can do that. So let's just start off with knowing we can do this. How do we do it is usually the question. So one thing I wanna talk about is our Bridges program at the Utah School for the Blind replaced our existing program that we had for high school and post-secondary education. And we replaced it, not because we weren't doing good things, but we wanted to stop and look at, are we being effective? Are we really equipping students? And so I want everyone to remember that is your first question. When you look at your program, when you're designing services, is it good or is it effective? Lots of people have good intentions and those are good things. What we need to strive for is effective. Are we getting the job done? And although we had great things happening, we were not getting to the outcome that we needed. So we burned the whole thing to the ground. Sometimes you just got to start over. And so bring the wrecking ball, baby, because that's what we did. And so welcome to our Bridges program. And even in the name Bridges, it was something that people knew. Most people, when you hear of a Bridges program, you get the idea of some kind of support program. And so um, we rolled with that. The other part of it is it also gave a nice visual to what we were trying to do. We wanted to bridge students from one section of their life to the next one. Now, the next thing that we did with our Bridges program is we didn't just call it one big fat program where everybody gets lumped into it. And so from the Bridges program, we have separate pathways. And so on the screen right now, I'm gonna walk you through what the Bridges program is comprised of. We have Bridges High School, which is on our way to becoming a hybrid technical high school, part of our five-year plan. In our high school program, we are setting out for graduation. We are not in the market for giving alternative diplomas or just certificates of completion. We're here to get students a rigorous education that's accessible and that is help them to their next level. We have Bridges Community Readiness, and this was important that we call it something other than college prep. 
And I know because you've seen our other webinars in this series, we have to unpack what college is, right? It's not just college, I get to go to one four-year university. And so rather, what was our goal? Our goal was to be community ready for our students, whatever that community is, their family community, their post-secondary community. These were the students that were going to the world that needed that connection. So Bridges Community Readiness. Our third program, which I'm really excited about, it is launching this school year, is our Bridges Employment Pathway. This is a one-year program that is actually partnered with Eric Yarberry at World Services for the Blind. Fun fact, he was in it. I don't even know how I truly met him other than somebody said something good. I met him and then said, hey, I've got a big fat idea. Would you be interested? And would you look at that? Magic came about. I share that point for you because it's time we knock down walls and thinking, right? I just threw out an idea to somebody else who had an idea and we put that together to see what we wanted. So have ideas, everyone. The way that we've been doing things hasn't always worked. We know the definition of insanity. So let's stop being insane and try new things. And then our fourth program is our Bridges, Bridges Residential Life Program. We do run a residential program for students when they are 16 and above. And in our residential life program, this was critical. A lot of residential programs, largely at schools for the blind, struggle with really helping with meaningful independent living skills. Um, and so we needed to be very clear. We're not in the market to be somebody else's mom. I'm already the mother of teenagers. I certainly didn't wanna take on 15 more teenagers. And so our goal is that we are in the market to be a shared living experience. That's what students are here for. They need to learn how to become roommates and members of a community. And it focuses on community engagement in the room, in the common room, at Target, but that's what our focus is. I wanted to share the breakdown of programs because what I hope you're seeing is the fact that we didn't just lump everything into one pot and said, I hope we find it's, that it's gonna work. We needed to look at our students and look at their needs. We have high school students that need to be prepared to live that thriving life, to have a rigorous education with high expectations. We had students that did wanna seek to college whether it's a certificate program, a four-year university. And then we had students that are really just ready to go and they want to be in the employment world. And so we needed to look at students and that helped us take this giant elephant of how do we prepare students and make it something digestible. The rest of my, present, my, my time here is I just wanna give some, some simple hows. What were things that I know you could do at your program? The very next bullet that's gonna come on the slide is that we also did a revised focus on the timeline that we are chasing. And this is where this whole research meets practice comes into play here. And I realized everybody kept talking about the rest of the student's life. Whoa, that's a giant burden for any program to take on when you have an 18 year old and you're gonna consider the rest of their lives. So we decided we're not in the business of preparing students for the rest of their lives. Rather, we are in the market for five years out. Our programs all focus on the next five years of a student's life. Who already feels lighter just hearing that, right? That was something we could do. We could program for the next five years of somebody's life. Taking on the, the responsibility of another human's life no bueno, we're not doing it. So that timeline was really helpful. From residential life to high school, our goal is always five years out. Remember, in transition at this phase of life, our goal is to launch students successfully, give them their best jump. That's what our program is about. Next slide, please. So how, how do we do that? Oh, can you hit, slide, hit one more time? All right, perfect. So the revised focus, that five-year goal, gave us the destination that we needed, right? We could see five years down in the road. I could see a student at 25 or 27. That was something we could do. Step two, our goals 
needed to be clear, focused, and most importantly, measurable. If we can't measure how effective we are, how do we know we're getting the job done? Good intentions just make for a, a safe environment, which is critical, but the learning and the engagement is what we were chasing. So for every goal, we asked simple questions. How will we accomplish this? And how will we measure it? And then trickling that down to the students. Every one of our students and bridges are part of the learning process. Again, that shift from a focus on teaching at the student to creating conditions where students can thrive and partner with us. I wanna give you an example because I'm sure somebody is like, that sounds great, Robin, but what do you really mean? So here's what I mean. This is an example from one of our three goals and our Bridges to Community Readiness Program. Number one, set students on a trajectory for successful young adulthood and lifelong learning by refining expanded core skills. Footnote, expanded core, that's that disability specific curriculum that all students with vision impairments, regardless of how much or how little vision they have, must have these skills. That's a really great sentence, but it's kind of vague. So we follow up with how will we measure it? So take a look there, you'll see how we measure it. And then how do we accomplish it? And that's what you see there. My last slide that I wanna round up with are three simple steps that each of you could do with your programs. Number one, we have a futures meeting. This is also known as a MAPS meeting. And I've hyperlinked, hyperlinked that if you get my slide deck. So in our MAPS meeting is where we identified these small actionable steps that everybody can take to support the students. It was an hour, we invite parents, community agencies, we get down to business. Second, five-year plan. This is designed by the students. The students project where they wanna be in five years of exiting our program, and then we work backwards. I just wanna note, we have a specific focus on independent living, community engagement, and post-secondary training. Do those three sound familiar? Yes, it's the critical parts of a good transition plan. We've got to attack those areas. Last but not least, a student strategic plan. This is a student designed plan based on that futures meeting. It includes short-term checkpoints. What does success look like? What steps do I take? So as I finish, let's recap. One, you don't have to have the whole world on your shoulders. Get a clear, focused strategy. We wanna help students within the next five years of their life. How will we do it? How will we measure it? Third, what will we do to get there? In our program, we do MAPS meetings, we do a five-year plan, and we do a student strategic plan. Those are three steps that your program can do and create momentum to go forward. Now, if anybody wants more information, because clearly I just gave you the appetizers and I know you want the main meal, I will gladly put my contact information into the chat. Until then, remember, just because it's overwhelming doesn't mean it's not impossible. And it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. We must upgrade our programs to meet the demands of today's world if we want our students to successfully thrive. I know I do, and I'm sure you do too, so we can make it happen. Collaborate. Eric didn't even know me six months ago, and yet I'm his new best friend. Okay, that being said, thank you so much. I will put my stuff in the chat, and I will turn it over to somebody who has a beautiful accent. So <laughs> whoever's doing that introduction, there you go. Thanks, Robin. This is Annie again, and, and Robin um, gave a great teaser too for us to just say if you have questions that you want to have answered we'll do q a at the end but pop those things in the q a box or in the chat box and we will gladly answer them we're going to hand it off now um, to a video of natalie natalie is here live with us but it is 6 a.m in australia and uh, she must be tired so i'm going to stop my screen share and give it to Andrea, who will share a video of Natalie that we will all enjoy together. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from where I'm joining you today, the Wallamadigal people of the Aora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Now, I do have a presentation to share, so I'll get that started.
So this is what I'll be talking about today. Introducing our Australian context, including our education system. Introduce Vision Australia, who and where we are. Explain our approach of employability and meaningful participation. Share three examples of our group programs, which are helping our young clients prepare for the future. And outline the certificates in access technology, which is about accrediting the Expander Core curriculum. Let's see if I can explain our Australian context on one slide. I have a map of Australia on the screen and it shows our six states and two territories. Our national capital is Canberra in the ACT, which is located in the southeastern corner of New South Wales on the eastern side of the country. Our national population is only 25.7 million. Our incidence of disability is approximately 17.7% of the population and our incidence of blindness or low vision is 2.3% of the total population. And unfortunately, we're like most of the world with high rates of unemployment or underemployment for those with blindness and low vision. We're trying to change that. <laughs> Services for Australians are generally provided by independent for-purpose vision agencies like mine, Vision Australia. We're a national provider of blindness and low vision services, supporting children and adults from early infancy through to elder Australians. So my map also has yellow dots indicating our Vision Australia offices and clinics. I think there's over 35 across the country. Given the majority of the population is along the eastern seaboard, that is where many of our offices are located with big teams in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. Our funding comes from federal, state or local government block and grant funding, philanthropy and fundraising, and more recently through the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which is about individual needs driven funding. Where am I? Well, I'm located in Sydney, which is on about the midway point of the coast of New South Wales. On this next slide, I have a photo of Sydney's Opera House at night. The white sails are illuminated and they are reflecting onto the harbour. I want to explain how our education system works. Each state or territory is responsible for education and they have some subtle differences, but we're all covered by national educational standards. In New South Wales, my home state, we have three different types of schools, the public school system through the New South Wales Department of Education, independent schools and systemic Catholic schools coordinated through regional dioceses. And we have three types of schooling streams, mainstream, support classes or units in a mainstream school, or schools for specific purposes, usually for those students with significant intellectual disabilities. We have itinerant specialist teachers for vision or ISTVs who support students with blindness or low vision in their educational settings. And the stages of education are preschool and early learning, kindergarten for one year, primary school from years one to six, and secondary school from year seven to 12. And in years 11 and 12, students following an academic path will complete their higher school certificate or HSC. They choose five or six subjects and these can be purely academic or they can also include some more vocationally driven subjects. Depending on what they choose, they get an ATAR or the Australian Tertiary Admissions Ranking. And this is a percentage, it's calculated on their results, which are ranked in comparison to everyone else in their cohort. ATARs are used for entry into university, where each university has a minimum ATAR entry mark for each of their degrees. And there are 10 levels of tertiary education, starting with certificate one, then two, three and four. Level seven is a bachelor's degree, level nine is master's and finally a doctoral degree is at level 10. Universities usually offer degrees from a bachelor level onwards. Some high schools will offer certificate level courses to students still at school, so they can start acquiring early tertiary qualifications, which can be counted as part of their ATAR. It's all very complicated, but essentially there are lots of options for students to do tertiary study, and it doesn't need to be immediately after high school. So where does Vision Australia fit in, given that most of us are not school teachers? We often work in schools, but we're more likely to be found in families' homes or in their communities. We have a team of specialist staff who work directly with children and young people and their families to support their journey in preparing for life after school, particularly tertiary study and hopefully employment. 
So this team includes early childhood specialist teachers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech pathologists, O&M specialists, access technology specialists, orthoptists, and psychologists and counsellors. So when I showed you that map of all the Vision Australia offices, well, there are representatives of all or some of these service providers in each region. Or we connect families with specific disciplines across regions if there isn't someone locally. And even though we're all attached to our local team and region, we're also part of that bigger team that's networked across the country. I'd like to explain our approach to service delivery for children, young people and families. It's something that we've been doing for a little while now, just because we were so concerned about the outcomes for young people, particularly in terms of their completion of tertiary education and then successfully obtaining and maintaining employment. So our approach is underpinned by this guiding principle of employability and meaningful participation connecting everything we do in the here and now with the future where meaningful occupation, being occupied, however that might look, is the universal goal for everybody. So everything that we're doing is viewed through a lens of employability, hence the photo on the screen, which shows a number of lenses piled one on top of the other and someone's peering through. We have four fundamental components to our service model. Family-centered practice, which basically means we view the family as our client, not just the child, because kids come with families and, and families are the decision makers. So we work within their context and collaborate. We have a coaching approach, particularly the occupational performance coaching approach where staff use specific language and questioning with families to help them discover solutions and solve problems and establish their self-sufficiency for when we're not there. Our service delivery content is based on the Expander Core curriculum. And we're always thinking about the here and now and connecting it with the future. Sounds cliche, but we've found it's actually something that families feel very cautious or frightened by because they don't understand what might be possible for their child in the future. And often everyone around them doesn't have a clue either or is too scared to raise it. And none of that helps the child or the young person. I have an audio bite by Miss Ten, who's been supported with an employability approach for the past few years. The here and now and the future. Well, when I first started with Vision Australia, I didn't know what I was gonna be when I grow up and I didn't even know anything about jobs. But luckily, Vision Australia saved me. They taught me about the jobs. They taught me about all the things that I'd need to know but I'm still learning. Right now, I feel like I know what I'm gonna be when I grow up, but I know that I might change as I'm growing. So I feel like it is very important to understand the here and now and the future. What I think of it is that they can both be linked because the here and now can lead to the future. Now, I'm learning about the jobs but when I grow up I'll hopefully have a job and know everything that I need to know about my own job. It's important as a visually impaired kid to know all the things before other people so that when you actually meet that thing or when the thing actually happens you know about it because you won't be able to see everything around you, you'd have to know everything around you. You can hear, you can also feel, but it's very important to know. So there you go. The here and now. So on the screen, I have a diagram representing the path of our programs for children, young people and their families, starting from the early childhood and going towards that destination of employability and meaningful participation in young adulthood. I'd love to explain all nine of them um, are represented by the icons, but with the time I'm going to cover four, career sampler, leap, leap up and the certificates. We do provide extensive individual services, but today I'll do the bigger programs that we hope will prepare our clients for future employability, including tertiary education. I should point out that the A in employability is deliberately a capital letter. It's about employing your ability. It's not just always about paid employment. So first, career sampler. 
Career Sampler is our annual national mentoring event, and we've just held our fourth across multiple states simultaneously in person and online. This is an event targeting career awareness and career exploration, raising awareness of what jobs exist and what's possible and exploring how you might get there. So we invite parents and families of children of any age, educators and children seven years and older. And we bring everyone together to hear from a range of people with lived experiences of blindness or low vision about pursuing and achieving career and employment goals. And there are some strong messages that we push. It's never too early to start career education. Employability does not just mean writing a resume, sending it off and hoping for the best. There are underlying skills and experiences which contribute to preparing for a future job or career. And skills for study and working will not just appear on demand as if by magic. Our mentors emphasize how the skills of the ECC have played out in their um, work environments. On the screen is a young boy, about eight, with his mum at our registration desk for the event. Our event starts with a keynote, followed by a facilitated panel Q&A. And our keynote in 2020 was Dr. Karen Wolf, and her presentation and the panel are available on our YouTube channel. If you wanted to look it up, you just need to search for Career Sampler. Our panel members over the years have included lawyers, a human rights officer, a project manager, Paralympians and professional athletes, a financier, chef, a fashion designer, an occupational therapist, an osteopath and technology experts. And this year, we hosted 33 mentors for our individual mentor conversations. And we organized our mentors into groups based on their job cluster. And we have seven occupational clusters that are related to skills, day-to-day -day tasks and work environments. And this comes from some research by the Foundation for Young Australians about some predictions for what future workplaces and the workforce is going to be like. Everyone who comes to Career Sampler receives a guidebook, which includes biographies for the mentors, plus a list of questions for informational interviewing. And the children and young people also get a Career Sampler passport. And I have photos of the large print and braille versions on the screen. And participants move amongst all of the mentors and the kids collect stamps in their passport for every mentor that they speak with. And if they speak to enough, then they've earned a prize. And that seems to be a pretty popular um, way to get them talking. The next thing I wanted to tell you about is LEAP, which is an acronym for Learn, Engage, Act, Perform. Now LEAP is a 10 month program running from February to November each year. It's for young people aged 14 to 18 years with blindness or low vision. And it's a leadership and employability program. And the leadership theme bit, that's the key. This program, it pushes participants way outside their comfort zone. It offers them opportunities that their peers are unlikely to get. And consequently, it provides an advantage in the employability stakes. So it's structured with individual 90 minute sessions each month with their designated member of the children and young people team. And any of those disciplines that I listed before could be the one that delivers the content for that client. We do uh, group meetings for an hour each month via Zoom. And we have Leap Online, which is our learning management system where stuff is uploaded and downloaded and they um, record their digital diaries. I love Leap. It's um, something that I've been involved with since its inception. And for the past two years, I've been doing the individual sessions with my clients and I've also um, been co-facilitating the groups. And we get young people from all across the country. I can't list everything that we cover in LEAP and there is a detailed monthly breakdown of the activities on our LEAP landing page if you want to read. Here are some of the big ones. We do exercises around identifying personal values and strengths and that's as a tool for um, determining what might be some possible career interest areas to investigate. The clients develop an elevator pitch. They learn how to use their voice for communicating confidently. They learn about personal branding. They design and run their own fundraising project. And the monetary goal is low and it's negotiable. And they can fundraise for the charity of their choice. And so far, our LEAP participants have raised about $25,000 over a few years. And we're talking about lolly jar guessing competitions and online trivia nights, dares and challenges, athletic pursuits, endurance events, those sorts of things. 
And on the screen, I have a photo from one of our fundraisers this year. This 17 year old is making bespoke braille bookmarks on commission, $10 per bookmark. Her goal was $600 and she's raised $1,300 so far. Clients have access to two kinds of mentors. They have ongoing support from a graduate mentor, plus the opportunity to speak with a mentor who has professional experience in the career field that they're interested in. So last year, my participant, who has a really strong interest in audio engineering, he was paired with someone who works in the industry. And he, my client described that conversation as the best thing ever. And he is now totally committed to pursuing that career path. He's followed through on the advice from his mentor on training and networking opportunities. And, and thanks to that networking, he now has a paid radio gig a few hours a week with a community, community radio station. So clients also have sessions with external experts from organizations like LinkedIn and the Melbourne Fashion Festival. And then there is preparing for and participating in a mock interview with senior leadership of Vision Australia. And this is where the class of 2022 is at right now. They're about to search for jobs prepare cover letters and resumes to apply for those jobs, and they'll have mock interviews for those roles. And just finally about LEAP, I have a, a screenshot of the, um, of the class of uh, 2020 in their LinkedIn in session. There's about 20 of them on, on the screen and a quote from um, a service provider, an OT about LEAP. LEAP is not a standard program. It's a 10 month commitment to attend monthly individual and group meetings participate in thoughtful and meaningful discussion and reflect on who they currently are as an individual and where they want to be in the future. So that's LEAP. Next, I want to talk about LEAP UP transition to tertiary. And it was in creating this program that we first connected with Leslie because we wanted to deliver a tertiary transition program to our first group of LEAP graduates. And we reached out to her about Compass. We actually have an article published about our pilot of Leap Up in the Journal of the South Pacific Educators and Vision Impairment in the 2021 edition. So Leap Up Transition to Tertiary is aimed at preparing students aged 14 to 18, year, 18 years old for tertiary education. It's a six week program and it's delivered online using Zoom and it's, so it's available to students across Australia. And there are two components. First comes the individual sessions with a primary service provider at the start and the end for goal setting and review. And then they have a session with an access technology specialist, an O&M specialist and an occupational therapist. And in those areas, they're targeting the technology needs, mobility needs and the independence and organization skills specifically required for tertiary settings. And the other part of Leap Up is the, the group sessions. And these run for 90 minutes each over three consecutive weeks. And these sessions are a mix of lectures and discussions. And we're trying to, to um, give the, the students an opportunity to experience what tertiary study might be like. So the clients access a learning management system to submit their completed assignment tasks. They have three to do outside of the, the grouped sessions. They use the LMS to access the meetings and, and to connect and collaborate with their fellow participants on discussion boards. So we're just started recruiting for our third cohort for Leap Up. And the final thing I wanted to tell you about is a project Vision Australia has sponsored to obtain national accreditation of the expanded core curriculum. This project was led by Dr. Melissa Fanshaw. She's a senior lecturer in education, a qualified vision support teacher. She's on the executive of the Australian Braille Authority, and she's vice president of SPEVI, the South Pacific Educators and Vision Impairment. And there were four driving forces for the project. Employment is low for Australians with blindness and low vision, and we wanted to do something about that. The skills in the ECC assist people to obtain and maintain employment, fancy that. The ECC for us is it's sometimes considered extra by those who don't understand the significance and the importance of it. And it's like the amount of work that's required just doesn't seem to, to count. And so, well, let's legitimize the importance of the ECC and schools and, and get it recognized. So what we have now are four certificates, one, two, three, four, those first four levels of tertiary qualifications I mentioned earlier in access technology, which is represented by the logo with four jigsaw puzzle pieces connecting to form a square. And this accreditation process was intense. 
The units in each certificate were written by Australian subject matter experts to match our learning context with input from over 100 stakeholders. And there are six stages to move through to have um, a certificate accredited. And this happened for each of the certificates. And they've just been recently approved by the ACARA board and all the education ministers. So we now have a series of nationally accredited courses for students in years nine to 12. So students with their vision support teachers can go through the skills of the ECC as a subject in their timetable. Um, doing the certificates is going to count towards their ATAR, that tertiary admissions rank. And in fact, just even doing a Cert 4 is sufficient for entry into most universities with or without an ATAR. And it's going to be accessible to students anywhere in Australia. And we're just right now, the final preparation is being done to launch them online. Great, I'm not sure what occurred there. But um, I think what we can do is um, we will make sure that the rest of the video is uploaded when we follow up with people and send that out so you can watch that last little bit. And I think it gave you a good overview, hopefully, um, of what Natalie, Natalie was talking about. And Natalie's here, so when we get to the end, we can, if folks have questions, you can ask them or pop them in the Q&A and chat. Um, sounds like some really cool things are happening in Australia. Um, and this is the website as well. I wanted to make sure that we share that it's visit visionaustralia.org. Um, and, and we will hand it off to Eric Yarbury now. So Eric, you are in the hot seat. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, first thing I want to start off with is the World Services for the Blind mission. So at WSB, we strive to empower uh, blind and visually impaired individuals in the United States and the and around the world to achieve sustainable independence. Um, that looks different to everybody. So if you ask one of your students what they want to do, chances are the students sitting right next to them, they're not going to they're not going to answer the same thing. Um, so we want to keep that in mind in all of our programs, life skills, career training, transition age youth. Um, every student, whether they're a youth or adult, is going to have a different goal. Uh, we want to meet them where they are. And that's one thing that World Services for the Blind does. Uh, this year is actually our 75th anniversary. Uh, and one thing that I think this has allowed us to to continue providing services for 75 years is to think outside of the box and um, partner with other organizations and folks like Robin and help them. Uh, that's what it's about. We, there is no way that one single organization who serves the blind and visually impaired can do it alone. So as you develop your programs, whether it's you reach out to me, reach out to Robin, reach out to um, the folks here today on this webinar, uh, do that. It, I promise that will serve you um, very well and that's that's what's going to make this field grow so as far as transition age youth is concerned world services for the blind provides we we have a prep and support services program that's our past program this program students have two options two tracks so as you're de developing your programs kind of think how do i break this up to where students aren't just thrown into one box as robin kind of mentioned we have a college prep track and a vocational prep track. In the college prep track, we have a, um, a partnership with the University of Arkansas at Little Rock here across the street from our, our campus. Students in that program, they can take assistive technology, orientation and mobility, um, activities of daily living, any classes that they need here. Uh, but more importantly, they're going to be enrolled in a three-hour college, uh, three-hour college credit course. Typically, it's a Comp One, a Comp Two, English 101, uh, English 102 uh, course. If what we recommend is that if students know that they're going to have a course that they're going to struggle with down the road, whether that be something like math um, or a science course, because we have TVIs who teach this course over the summer who support the who support our students who are enrolled in the college course, we recommend they, they uh, take a, a stab at those um, tougher courses that they think they, they'll need support on. 
um, that way it's, it's a real learning opportunity for them and, and uh, they actually get some value out of it. For our vocational prep students, we, before the program starts, we have an interview process and we sit down with them and assess what it is they really want to learn. Um, we do have a work-based learning experience as a part of this, so students do receive a stipend. Uh, but as a part of that, I want students to be in a workplace setting that is meaningful uh, and somewhere that when they leave, they can use those connections in the community that, that they've met uh, down the road to help them find jobs. And it is, I'll tell you, it is so fun to walk into a job site and where you've, you've put in a little bit of effort, and that's what we do to get this student placed there. Uh, but when they realize that it's a place that they really want to be, it is, it is so impactful. It lets us know that we're doing the right thing. And that's how we have an impact is place students where they want to be, give them an opportunity um, to, to really have the experience in the field, uh, get, let them meet the folks that they want to meet. So another important thing is that we work with the Disability Resource Center at the college. Um, this is huge. So one thing that you guys in transition will be doing, I know for sure, is talking about self-advocacy. What we do is have them schedule their own appointments. From day one, they're doing everything on their own. They're enrolling themselves in classes. They're purchasing their books, of course, with our help uh, financially. And then they're actually going back and taking the course, sending emails to the instructor about accommodations that they need. All of this stuff is done independently and we, we support them along the way. So we, we do as little hand-holding as possible uh, to create as close to a real world experience. Uh, but we do provide those safety nets that, you know, that what organizations like us are here for. That's, that's why we're needed and that's why your programs are needed. Um, that way, when they don't have you, they know what to do because you've showed them. Another really neat thing that we started this year is we partnered with the university, uh, the housing department in the university. Our students actually stay in the college dorms, so they get that experience and they have to walk uh, to their classes on campus or walk across to World Services for the Blind rain, sleet, snow, it's summer. You don't know what's gonna happen in Arkansas. So it just depends. Um, really, we just want them to get that experience and, and make sure that they're not, and there's other students, sighted individuals who are going through camp. So it's, it's a really fun time for them and, and they, they get to be away from home and, and really in, in an environment where other people are going through the same thing. So moving on to industry standard, career training programs, keeping it in the vein of transition age youth. One thing that, that you heard Robin mention is that I've partnered with her um, and helped her develop what it is to get students ready uh, for a career. As she said, it's not about, you're, pre you're not preparing um, your students for the rest of their life. She said five years, for us at World Services, once we get them, it's the next three years. I want to make sure that they they have the skills they need to go out and get a job. Whether it's us or any other organization that's out there supporting them, they just need to know where the services are. And, and that's one thing that I think will grow this field as well, is that we're we're not focused on, on ourselves. We're focused on breaking down these silos and uh, really developing those partnerships. And, and Robin and I, I think, have have really made a good impact and and there's a lot good a lot of good that's going to come out of out of her program so our career training programs here at world services for the blind include assistive technology instructor credit counselor microsoft office specialist information technology uh, licensed massage therapist and certified medical biller all of these programs are industry standard. That means that when a student graduates, they sit for a proctored exam by an industry certifying organization. For example, our medical billing program is the, the American Association of Professional Coders. One thing that I always tell our students as they go out looking for jobs is that blind, if it's not related to your industry of interest, isn't necessary. It does not need to be on a resume. Uh, if you're going to be a medical biller, you need to have something on your resume that 
relates to that field, not world services for the blind. I've said that for a couple of years now, and I really think it's starting to take hold and our students understand that. Um, and it's also really elevated our level of services that we're providing because in order to get students into integrated employment, um, we have to work twice as hard um, as their sighted peers and, and the schools that are out there training sighted individuals. And we know that, and it is, it is challenging, but it is extremely rewarding when you see that we, that students are, are placed in, in their first day on the job. So moving into additional services, and I, I can talk all day, so I'm trying to make this brief, but really I want you guys just to kind of get an idea of, of how we, how we see our students and what we provide them. The, the main thing that we strive to do here at World Services is place our graduates in integrated employment. Um, everybody who knows of World Services or who is in the vocational rehabilitation field knows that that's right. That's the end goal. We talk about that all the time. Uh, how we do that, though, once a student has an industry standard certification, you've kind of got you've you've got something you can essentially a key you can go plug into um, opportunities. You've got a line on a resume. You you've we've got something to work with. Uh, and how we put that into action is we talk about employment preparation and job development for our summer students who are in the transition age youth pass program no matter what track they're on, they have to explore their career. At the end of the program, they have to put together a, essentially a, uh, a poster board presentation, and they have to present on what they've learned about their career, how they're going to reach their goals, um, really in depth, not, not a basic level of this is what I wanna do and, and it makes, I'm, I'm gonna make a lot of money. We want to make sure that our students, whether it's through us or someone else, like I said before, they know where they need to go to, to reach these goals. And if they don't have the tools to be successful, they know where to go to find those tools. Another important thing and really an important key to placing individuals in employment, again, whether it's transition age youth or uh, just general adult age VR clients is through workforce internships. Um, I, over the past couple of years, I have really worked to grow our workforce internships and on-job training programs here at World Services. Uh, for you guys, the best way to do this is start reaching out to your community, uh, employers in your community, and ask them, what is it in your office that you really need man support on, you need help, and how can we have a conversation about a blind and visually impaired person coming in there, how, to, how the best way to start that conversation is address it up front. How do, you, how do they feel about hiring someone who's blind or visually impaired? Oftentimes people are scared they're gonna have to take them to the bathroom every time. And that's not the case. And we, we have that conversation. I've had it many times. So in this internship, the student really gets a hands-on experience of, what it's like to be in the field. And I, uh, I make sure I'm, I'm pretty firm. I make sure that our partner employers aren't just sitting them at a desk. I want these opportunities to be meaningful, especially if our students are earning a stipend. I don't want to set up false expectations for income down the road. That doesn't do anybody good, uh, especially our students, and it doesn't do us any good down the road. We've done nothing for them. So make sure that if you do set up internships for your students, that it's meaningful for both them and the employer. That's, that's how it works. It's got to be a win-win. Otherwise, you're, you're just wasting time. One other thing that we do is a free online skills assessment. So in talks with Robin about her Bridges program, um, we're looking, speaking on on really on behalf of Robin, we're looking to prepare someone for life after, after school. And what we do here at World Services for the Blind and something we're helping Robin with is assessing an individual's needs before they even begin a career training program 
or before they're, they're ready to enter into what would essentially be post-secondary school. So for us, we provide a free online skills assessment and anyone can take it. We've, it, it's just, it's free. There's no catch. The, in this assessment, it's all online. Uh, we've built it to where it just assesses an individual's ability to use word processing, email, we're assessing writing, reading, and math, as well as written and verbal communication. Uh, we also assess an individual's ability to manage their time and how much do they actually, how much dedication do they want to put into to their own goals? Uh, because, you know, as, as teachers and uh, professionals in the field that you spend a lot of time reminding students to do what you told them to do two days ago. So this assessment will give us a hands-off idea of how much a student really knows, how dedicated they are, um, and are they ready to begin either a, either a college course or a career training course? So something to keep in mind, are they ready to go to work? One of the, the another additional service we provide is our virtual fundamentals uh, skills training. If a student fails this assessment, you can send them to the services in your state. You can send them to Robin. That doesn't matter to me, but what we do is provide our students with fundamentals training in assistive technology. Uh, what that means is a lot of people think that they have technology skills because they look at Facebook and YouTube all day, but that doesn't help them actually achieve the, the job. That doesn't help them achieve the tasks and goals that they have to, to be, accept, be really successful on the job. So we have someone work one-on-one -on -one with a student based on their weak areas that we have outlined from the report done in the online assessment. So we don't cover any material that's not needed to be covered. If it's just Excel training that they need, we can do that. If it's just logging on to Zoom, teaching Zoom, working with that, um, we can do that. You guys kind of get the idea. So again, that's, that's World Services for the Blind in a nutshell. Uh, I am definitely open for questions. You guys don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we, we're here to really see the next 75 years of blindness uh, be a strong 75 years. And it doesn't, that doesn't have world services for the blind uh, and lights. That's, that's all of us coming together and seeing that our students have the services that they need to be successful. So um, thank you guys. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Eric. And Eric, um, there was a, just a quick question before we move on about how people can connect with you. Is there an email address that you can reach out? Yes, and I'll send, I'll put all this in the chat. Great, fantastic. Um, and so Leslie Thatcher, going to hand it off to you to tell us about Compass, and then we'll awesome. jump into Q&A after that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you, everyone. I hope, um, so I'm going to talk today about Compass, which is the direct service program that we run here at Perkins for college aspiring students, their families, and their educators, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, it is research driven using a coaching model uh, that is very research driven um, and has is used in higher education in academic support offices and disability resource offices across the country. Um, so with that said, um, returning to my favorite theme, which is college readiness in 2022, um, it's, this is an interesting dilemma and Compass was really designed to address many of the struggles that we've seen with students who aspire to attend college. It, they're operating in a low information environment. Uh, we know that school counselors in our public schools are struggling under caseloads of 450 plus students per school counselor um, with a recommended caseload per school, school counselor being about 250 students per, this is per the National Association of College Admissions Counselors. Um, that is a burden that is um, really unsustainable from a school standpoint, but what it, what it leads to for our students is a lack of support in their post-secondary planning in a day-to-day -day uh, way. Um, there's not a lot of one-on-one -on -one support 
support. Um, and it often falls on the backs of teachers that are visually impaired who don't have training in this. Um, we, there's also a very, uh, I'll say decentralized or siloed system of support for our students, often living within the teacher of the visually impaired, a parent, um, and possibly a vocational rehab or transition counselor in a student state commission for the blind. Um, although we often find students who have not engaged with their state commission for their blind, um, even though those students may be legally blind. So we have this gap of information, but we also have a society and a media that loves to buzz about what are you going to college? What are you going to study? Uh, what colleges are you applying to? And so on. So it makes it quite difficult for our students to, or their families to kind of go up against that and have a functional answer. Um, additionally, we know that students are encountering um, significant grade inflation and often poor academic advising because of this decentralized range of support that our students um, often encounter, not all the time, but often in their K-12 education. Um, so very complex when you add layers on such as um, very well researched and established challenges for students um, aspiring to attend college as first generation college attendees, English language learners, students from rural environments that may, uh, for, especially for our students with vision impairment, had little experience um, commuting or engaging in more complex transportation systems. Um, and under resource schools that may not be providing the range of academic rigor that colleges are assuming our students are being exposed to leads to a really complex, I like to think of it as three dimensional chess, um, that, uh, that creates a range of challenges that our students may or may not even be aware of. When we layer that on the demanding complex skills that college demands of our students around technology, um, you heard Nat talk about learning management systems, those are online digitally based platforms that are, um, they're in some cases accessible, in some cases not. But if our students don't have experience managing and utilizing a number of different tools to access those learning management systems, um, that can lead to right out of the gate during orientation or registering for classes, significant challenges in having um, even uh, a, a running start at college. Um, and when we think about executive functioning skills and academic skills, um, that have also been well researched and established as key core skills for our students. Um, there's a lot of gaps in students preparation, um, both research demonstrated and that we've encountered in our direct service programs. So we have created, and we can go to the next slide, a program that is, is really point, point by point addressing these gaps. We created Compass, which addressed something we learned when we ran a direct service program for students who were high school graduates or aged 18 to 22, we realized that those students had graduated from high school without those skills in technology, academic skills, executive functioning skills, and independence. They um, arrived to our, re our residential program. It was a nine month program uh, of the 12 students who graduated, we had um, a majority who did not know how to type on a keyboard, did not know how to use a laptop, and had no experience working within a learning management system or problem solving those, those complex technical challenges that um, either as a low vision user or as a screen reader user take a long time to think, to develop the skills, the stick to it and the, and the independence to address those challenges. So um, we learned in running that program for two years that we really needed to start earlier and we needed to start holistically. So dealing with not only the student, but the parent or family that um, the student was living with, as well as the educator, typically it's a teacher of the visually impaired who often has not worked with a college bound student before um, and needs support to create the more robust skills that their students need. So um, Compass is a nine month program offering 30 hours of coaching, direct one on one coaching for the student, educator and family um, to help build up both the self awareness of their strengths and their challenges Think of Eric's um, 
test online test that he talks about, um, students often may not have a full awareness of what their actual technology skills are and how they may meet the demands of a world outside of the very supportive high school environment they're in. Looking at the time, and I'm going to rush through the rest of this slide. So um, coaching model, 30 hours each for each leg of our learning triad. And it allows time for students to develop and shift their identity as a student with low vision or blindness to determine how they are beginning to integrate that into their identity and the actions they need to take to meet their post-secondary goals. It's a tall order, but we also help those students develop those skills through weekend workshops, which are three hours once a month that help our students begin to meet other individuals who've been on the same journey they're on who are either in college or in the workforce and have had their own wandering path to get to where they are. That helps our students see that there is no one way, that making mistakes is part of the gig for any of us out there, but particularly for individuals tackling these big challenges with a visual impairment. Um, and it helps normalize the struggles and the worries our students have. It helps open up possibility for them and gives them new language. We can work virtually, but in a virtual, and we can work nationally but in a virtual environment. And we've had students from, I think, 11 states so far participate. Next slide. Um, fun fact, also I'm in my research for this particular presentation, uh, a fun fact is over 30% of our of students in college change their major. Um, once they enter college. I joke with college students all the time about the major of the day or the major of the week because they're exploring things they've never had a chance to explore before. So it's appropriate to change majors, but for our students, it can be quite impactful. Um, I've covered several things in this um, slide, but we've had so far between our residential program and our campus program, 32 graduates so far. Um, and our, our data definitely demonstrates those same gaps I alluded to in my previous slide. Um, and this pretty much sums it up. The other thing I'll mention is that we have created a college readiness checklist, which puts in the student's voice, I can type 45 words a minute, I can cross an intersection independently without any adult support, um, and so on. We've also created a technology competencies um, and an entire online college readiness resource to begin to address that low information decision-making to help students make informed decisions with a depth of understanding about the difference between high school support driven by the IDEA and college level support and the need for independent self-advocacy as driven by the ADA. I could go on and on about all of that, but that is a brief summary of the research-driven program Compass um, that we are now running for students grade nine through 12. So with that said, I'm gonna stop and have any lob out pose some questions to the panelists um, and to see if there's questions from. Yeah, thanks Barbara. Leslie. Yeah, if people have questions, you can throw them in the Q&A or in the chat, you can also raise your hand. There are multiple ways that you can interact with us. We'd love to hear your questions. We just got a ton of great information about different programs and the innovative approaches they are taking. Um, so one of the questions that I just wanted to toss out to uh, the group is, um, given what we know about the skills that students need for post-secondary education and for the workplace, um, in your program's experience, where do you see opportunities for student growth and development? And who will be bold enough to take that? I'll take it first. Go for it, Eric. So one of the things that I see, and this was not even discussed in my presentation, is confidence. Um, and this isn't something that you can just teach in a classroom. This is something that you have to put your students in environments where they can actually you know, work on this. this confidence is needed in college it's needed in the workplace and you can only give them so much before they have to start doing speaking on their own and and networking and and getting where we expect sighted peers to be so thanks so much did did other folks uh want to chime in too with their perspectives this is robin 
Um, so just one quick thing that I really have thought about is we keep telling students that we they have to do this, right? And we we find variations of telling them this. But I think one of the first things is unpacking why and how and where do we connect? Because when students really learn how to be self-determined, they become self-determined and they will go for the things that they want. But if they're not doing it, the questions I ask, did I just give superficial information? Have I just said college is important, but I've never really connected how it impacts their life or really um, what it looks like? Um, because it's a complicated world that students are living in. Um, and I think that for me, that's one of my first parts of this. Let's unpack all of this. Let's get clear. Let's start making connections, which is where we really started with the student strategic plan, student driven plan, student portfolio. Are we sitting down with students and reviewing or are they just memorizing facts? Oh, I should know this. But do do they know the why? I, I think that's some of the discussion that we could really start having with students. It's great. This is, this is Leslie. I um, I love that. Um, and yeah, Robin, I know you and I yak about this all the time. And Matt, I know you and I do too. Um, the, you know, the other part, I think what you're alluding to Robin and Eric and is time that our students need more time with adults to help unpack what are my strengths? What are the areas I'm not so good at? I can say I'm I think everybody on this call, you know, I'm good at presenting. I can talk about things. Um, I'm not so good at maybe keeping my house clean or maybe my papers organized, you know? It, what, what are the things we're good at? What are the things that we're challenged by? What are the strengths we bring to it? Or am I, you know, the most welcoming person in the world? Well, that's a strength that could connect to an area of, of future employment. And we need to help our students understand that. That's that, the, the, um, incidental learning that's lost for some of our students. And, and I, I, that takes time, um, not demanding that our students understand or are able to say, I want to major in business. Well, they don't know what that means. And we need to help them do that. And I'm, I'm looking down at my friend, Nat, and wondering if you have anything to contribute, Nat. Uh, I do, yes, thank you. Uh, I think, the biggest learning that I've had from working in this space is it's never too early to start having these conversations just to be acknowledging the impact of incidental visual learning. So if peers have been learning that um, just by watching people of all different ages doing whatever work or whatever study or, or going to all these different locations, if the, the child or young person with blindness or low vision hasn't seen that, then how are they knowing about it? How are they building that that developmental continuum of knowledge that's building up to that and I'm going to make informed decisions or choices when I get to the end of, of high school. So I start having these conversations as early as possible with, with probably with families, but then also with the, the kids and the young people themselves. It's not ever too early to start these conversations. And he's unmuting. <laughs> Yeah, I was navigating things. Um, there was another question that uh, came up that I wanted to ask about too. This is something that Leslie and I talk about a lot, which is secondary diagnoses or co-occurring conditions. So, you know, I think um, a lot of us support students who have blindness, vision loss, a visual impairment, and something else, right? They might also have a co-occurring health condition, chronic health condition, mental health condition, um, autism, intellectual developmental disability. Um, so I'm interested in hearing from folks how your uh, program kind of takes into account um, the variation in needs that students might have when they have co-occurring conditions. Um, and I will lo lob that into the Zoom universe and whoever wants to catch it, <laughs> go first, jump in. I'm happy to jump yeah, in. I, I, will, I would cold call on people, but Leslie, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, I think about, I, I, I think there's opportunity. I'm, I'm in an optimistic mindset because this has been such an awesome panel. There's opportunity um, to start early as 
those conditions may be diagnosed um, to talk again from a strengths-based perspective about strengths and about challenges that come along with, with any diagnosis and, and um, obstacles um, or challenges that you need to consider um, as you transition out of the support of, se of secondary school here in the United States into college. And, and so um, helping unpack some of the details of that and what the um, obstacles to learning might be. It may or may not be a student's access to the print environment or the visual, the, their visual world. Um, and it may, some of the larger obstacles um, may be um, related to that secondary diagnosis. And we need perhaps that time, that magic of time to unpack that um, and it support our educators in bringing in a broader team to address those secondary diagnoses. Um, with a more broader lens, with a more broader lens, goodness, with a, a broader lens. Um, and uh, look at some of the programs that are out there that may address that, which may be a more impactful disability than the, the vision loss itself. So I'm wondering if any of my panelists. Yep. So one thing that we do, is we do reach out to the community for additional services. Um, and right now we are actually in the progress of, of renovating some of our space here on campus into a therapeutic group home for individuals with intellectual disabilities who are blind, so they have that secondary disability. Um, so I think it's just reaching out, knowing that you know we may not be able to provide every service that's needed, but who can? Again, it goes back to partnerships and, and breaking down those silos and and reaching out to those who, who know. Awesome, Robin, did you have anything or Natalie to add about how your uh, programs manage um, students who have needs because of co-occurring conditions? Well, this is Robin. Um, I got lost in our next question, which I'm super excited for us to answer, by the way. So that's why I was like, maybe I should wait. Um, <laughs> but the, the one thing I, I will say is, I think looking at our team, we can only do what we know or what we can do. And I think giving our team the grace to handle that. And so in our program at Bridges, especially, although we do have students that do have those um, predominantly maybe learning needs and et cetera, we focus on the impact of blindness as what that's, that's the impact we can make. And then I think this is shared in a variety of ways from everyone else, leveraging others um, who can help, but if we can, if we can fill the, the need of the blindness aspect or the vision impairment, that's what we can do. And then, um, with that, that's why one of the reasons why our employment pathway is only one year, we don't want to burn out the student's clock when they needed other services. Right. And so if we keep them in our bubble, first of all, it's a bubble. Um, and we need to get them out of that. And second, they may need crucial other services. And so we really do our best to um, keep it tight and know when to release students instead of holding on and, and running out their clock. Thank you. Um, let's jump to this next question, actually. Uh, there is a participant who's a new TVI and she's gonna have two students, one in ninth grade, one in 12th grade. They'll be new to her this coming year. And she was wondering where should she start with college readiness? <laughs> so uh, who wants to take that first? I'll step back because well, I just- Who's gonna pound, right? I know, I knew it. We were all like, I'm ready to answer. I'm ready to answer. Yeah. Um, so one thing we are putting into, into chat right now, a lot of great resources that guide you. Um, I know that I saw the college readiness checklist, which I love using. I also put in the expanded core high school readiness checklist, which does have an alternative checklist for students with multiple disabilities. So one, I would tell you there. Second is let's start looking at what life is like in small um, pockets of time. So if we're talking about that young student Yes, we want to have a young conversation or we want to start talking about it, but let's not talk about the rest of their lives. So if you have a third grader, let's talk about the skills needed by sixth grade. Does that make sense? 
Now we've taken this big elephant and we've made it digestible, right? Because ultimately, if we look too far down the road, we forget the critical milestones that need to be hit. And so we need to make sure that our students are, I'm going to use the word competitive, right? With their peers, that they have access that they have, a, they have developed the skills. So I think what was the grade, I said third, but I think it was actually fourth grade that you, your students were. But either way, if you have a student in one grade, look up three grades and then start and get them there. Take this in small steps. That will ensure you've hit the details, right? But I would say- okay, Go ahead, Leslie. Uh, yeah, uh, and yes, and, um, mm -hmm. but know where the end, Mm -hmm. where, where you're aiming for in grade 12 and um, sure. even consider a four or five year if your state will allow you or your district will allow you plan depending on where that student is, their age, their skill level, their um, all of those things. But knowing, um, I use typing because it's concrete, um, you know, if, if you have to be typing fluently at 45 or 60 words a minute by grade 12, starting at the end of grade 11, that's a tall order. But starting in sixth grade, that's super manageable, right? 10, 10 words per minute per year. I'm not doing the math right, but you, you follow my logic there. So doing some backwards planning, but to Robin's point, mm -hmm. how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? For sure, looking at that three-year window helps you then gauge that pace to get those details, those crucial details with their whole team to working together. I would also like to add too that keep in mind um, transitioning from working if you're a, a, a teacher transitioning your student from working with you to to college is you've got multiple choices there. What I always recommend is that students start with a two year school so they can they they can reach an associate's degree and they they've got an achievement. Then they transfer to a four year university that does two things. First, it allows them to transfer from their small pond they're in right now um, and puts them in a, a small, mid-sized university where they, they have access to services quickly. It's a small environment, smaller classes. Then they've, they've reached a goal. And by the point they've got that associates, they've done that on their own and they can move on. And they, they are by that point advocating for themselves. And that it is general, it is a pretty, it's a sweeping general goal, but it, it's what I like to tell people who are just wanting some quick advice. I just wanna say something about kids with multiple impairments. Um, communication, communication is vital. Um, I'm not sure how far with the disability, how the severity, but communication is vital. For, for children with um, significant additional disabilities. And I apologize, I saw that your question said I have two students and I took that as second grade. Um, but I do see that you had one in ninth and 12th grade. I can't stress enough at that level that it's game time with realistic feedback. I think that's something that Leslie and I chat a lot about, the realistic feedback. If they don't have the academic skills we need to be honest that they don't have the academic skills. All we need to do is look at then what do they need to get there? Um, but I, I just would really implore you with ninth and 12th graders, it is pedal to the middle with the whole team. You are one person, that guidance counselor, the general ed teacher, the parent, um, let's be honest. Let's be honest about the feedback and let's be aggressive. And there's nothing wrong with a fifth year of schooling. Some people shy away from that. Bridges is a college prep program. Our students have their diploma and they can still receive our services. So um, look for those options. And we're here. We've all put our contact information. So Shelly, if you need help, you just got 15 life preservers thrown at you, right? So take us up on it. We're, we're happy to help you. Um, and with that, we are just slightly over time, I wanted to give a big thank you to all of the panelists today. I think all of us learned something um, new about all of the different types of programs and approaches that people are taking. And that's really exciting to see that there's so much actually going on in this space um, and, and room for more innovation and room for people to bring some of these pieces into their own programs or to their own work. 
um, with students with vision loss. So that's really exciting takeaway. Um, we have another webinar coming up. It's the final in our series of four. It's coming up on August 10th. Um, and it's called What's Next? Moving from Contemplation to Action. So we'll be taking some of the information that we've learned in our previous webinars and starting to operationalize it and think about how we can bring it uh, into practice. Um, and everyone can watch all of these webinar series um, at the Perkins website. The link is up on the screen. We will share this recording. We will share the resources. Um, with everyone who has attended, and it'll also be posted on the website as well. Leslie, is there anything I'm missing as we're wrapping up? Um, nope. Uh, Shelly, you're right about the time. And Natalie, I want to do an extra special shout out to Nat for uh, joining us so early in the morning and um, bringing the brilliant programs going on through Vision Australia. I, I'm really, really interested in the certificate, certificates. I think that's so cool. Um, so no, uh, thank you, Annie, for moderating this. And uh, we'll see you on August 10th. Maybe not you, Nat, but everybody else. <laughs> you can if you want. Thanks, thank everyone. You.